Silas in jail and as I read that it said that they were worshiping and praising God and it was in the darkest moment in their life everything was bleak and dark around them physically they were beat they were hurting their future looked like the, the death was inevitable yet in the midst and in the dungeon they worship God and in response to their praise and their worship God set them free but not just them he said everybody else that was in that prison 
that was in bondage was set free because two men worship God. This house tonight needs a miracle. We have so many of our dear saints suffering COVID and cancer and, and every other kind of disease and infirmity. Our country is in turmoil. There's so much confusion. We need a mighty move of the Holy Spirit to take over. And we're wondering what's going to happen. Who, who, well, friends, it's, it, can I say this in faith? It's going to start tonight. It's going to start tonight. The miracle is going to come tonight. And I'm not speaking wishful thinking. Friends, this is a testimony in my spirit that God is working miracles, but it's going to happen in the midst of worship and praise. So I'm going to ask these two sections. I don't want you to ask God for anything. I want you to worship God in your own way, in your own mind, in your heart. Begin to worship God. Begin to worship Him and praise Him. If you do it standing or sitting with your hands lifted by your side, worship God. Worship God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hold that. God is moving, and we're going to pause for just one second. Come on, church, you can worship. It's going to take a little bit, but we have to break through. We read in Joshua 1, of you can put a thousand to fight because the Lord your God fights for you just as he promised. Worship him. Worship him. You can send a thousand to fight by your praise and your worship. The rest of us, let's lift our hands as we're going to pray in faith, believe it. You on this right side, don't stop your praise. Don't stop your worship. Uh-uh. Come on, break through. Break through. We're just going to pray, believe it. We're going to join prayer and praise and worship. We're going to bind it together. Our weapons of warfare are mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. In the name of Jesus, Father, oh, the Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray, not just for those that are in the house tonight, but Lord, those watching from home through the media, Lord, that wherever they are at, Lord, they're in need of a miracle. Lord, we have so many here in the house. We've listed them, Lord, so many times, and we continue, Lord, our, our, our prayer and our, and, and, and our hope has not di diminished at all. Lord, my faith has not been shaken. Lord, I just know in whom I have believed in. And Lord, we cry out to you. You are my healer. You are our healer. Lord, you are our provider. Lord, you are the ever-present help in time of trouble. Lord, we lift up all those that are in need of a miracle right now, Lord. We lift them up in prayer, Lord, and believing that a miracle has been, has been sent to their side, Lord. And a breakthrough has happened even now in the name of Jesus. We declare it. We proclaim it for healing, for miracles, for provision, for direction, for clarity of thought. Lord, we bind and rebuke everything that comes against your will. And we loosen the power of your Holy Spirit. We worship you, Lord. As we sing this chorus one more time, you deserve the glory. You deserve the glory. You Sing it together with us. The glory in the
word. A word of appreciation and thank you to the Lord. How many know God has answered? Yeah. God has answered. God has answered. Precious Jesus. Praise your name, Lord. We thank you for your presence in this place. We thank you for your people gathered together. This sweet fellowship, faith, spirit of the Lord, and promise after promise that the Lord has given unto us. Amen. I want to invite you to continue to lift up those of our dear church that need a miracle, that need God's help, that he'd be with them, encourage them, strengthen them minister to them. Amen. But before you're seated, turn around and greet those around you. Let them know that you're glad that they found their way here to First Assembly of God this Wednesday night as we are here to celebrate His presence and also to enjoy His Word. I got to correct something I said Sunday morning. It wasn't in the sermon necessarily, but it was something I said about the uh, timeline for the balcony. I said 160 days. It's 120 days. I kept saying 160 days, it's 120 days. So contractually, we should have, uh, should have it done in 120 days. So that's much better. But that also means that uh, we need your help to pay for it. So we encourage you, if you have not already done so, to uh, do your best and help us. Now, Teen Challenge Banquet is coming up Friday, September 24th. And Sam Wagliardo, lift your hand in case somebody doesn't know who Sam is. Sam will have tickets that you can purchase from him. It's always a great time to go and be encouraged by the testimonies and support the ministry of Teen Challenge that this church has always supported. John chapter 13 is where we finally have gotten this far. The rest of the chapter of the book of John is going to be in Jesus' final week, his final days leading up to the cross, the resurrection. John will spend almost half of the book on that portion of the ministry of Jesus, the life of Jesus. This morning, I, this evening, I want to share with you some lessons, this lessons from the Lord's Supper. I want us to begin reading in John chapter 13. We're going to first read verses 1 through 4, because John's account of the Last Supper is different than the Synoptic Gospels account of the Last Supper. When you get a grasp of the different books of the Bible... Many times when you want to find something, you'll know which of the Gospels really spend some time on it. If you want the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount, don't look for it in John, because John doesn't cover it. You maybe go to Matthew. If you want the, uh, the story of the Nativity, that type of thing, you really don't go to John either. You really go to Luke. Luke does a great job of that. And, and John's Gospel does tell us some things that the other Gospels do not. So let's read. Now, before the Feast of the Passover... Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart from the world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And during supper, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had handed all things over to him, and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, got up from the supper. And laid his outer garments aside, and he took a towel, and he tied it around himself. We'll stop right there. John's account of the Last Supper is the most unique of the four Gospels. It has some similarities with synoptics. Who remembers what the synoptics are? The synoptics are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Because Matthew, Mark, and Luke overlap a lot. And there is great debate amongst theologians and Bible scholars as to who was the first, and the others borrowed from them, who borrowed from who, because they all overlap and sometimes it is hard to know if it's Matthew, Mark, or Luke. But John is very distinct. His gospel presentation stands alone from the synoptic gospels. But there are some similarities even in John's account of the Last Supper with the synoptics. Number one, uh, all of them focus on Jesus' final meal with his disciples. So all of them have the setting of Jesus gathered together to celebrate a final meal with his disciples. The events... And this Last Supper is in proximity, in all of the Gospels it mentions, that it is in proximity with the Jewish Passover. And all of them include the revelation of betrayal and the discussion as to the identity of the betrayer. And there is, of course, the famous, although perhaps not biblically accurate, depiction of the Last Supper. Who knows what I'm talking about? 
And they are all kind of questioning each other. It's that moment in which they are wondering, who is it? Because Jesus has revealed it. One of them, one of the 12, is going to betray him. Those are similarities, but there are differences. The differences of John's account with the synoptics is that John does not describe the instructions of Jesus or the preparations for the meal. In the other Gospels, we have Jesus telling them to go ahead and make the preparations. John doesn't give us any of those details. John does not mention, this is very important and very, very different from the synoptics, because John does not mention the meal. He does not mention the bread, and he does not mention the cup. We have the communion supper, and if we are going to go to one of the gospel accounts, John will not provide us what we're looking for. We'd have to go to one of the synoptics, because he doesn't mention that. He, he bypasses it altogether, ignores it altogether. And there, I, I believe there's a reason for it. John doesn't tell about the meal, the bread and the cup, but he does tell something that the other gospels do not tell. You know what it is? That Jesus in that final supper with his disciples, he did something, and that is that he washed the disciples' feet. Only John tells us of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. And it could be said that John's discourse Jesus' discourse in John's gospel is more of an intimate nature. John is the last gospel written. Some have pointed to this difference between John and the synoptics to say that there is contradiction or error in the Bible. But it is very easy to understand why it is that John presents information that the synoptics don't and why John doesn't present things that the synoptics do. It, there's no way of knowing exactly if John possessed a copy of the synoptics, but it's safe to assume, because John is the last gospel written, it is safe to assume that John was familiar with the content of the other gospels. And he chose, it would make sense, to include information that Matthew, Mark, and Luke did not include. Hence, the telling of the washing of the disciples' feet. And John also chose, he felt perhaps that it was not necessary to repeat it, he chose to leave out narratives that were already covered in the other evangelists. John records Jesus' words that reveal what Jesus was thinking shortly before his arrest, his suffering, and his death. John's account is more intimate than the synoptics and focuses more on Jesus' love for the disciples than on the meaning of the new covenant symbolized by the bread and the wine. John's account reveals a number of things. It reveals Jesus' foreknowledge in the passage of Scripture. John chapter 13 revealed Jesus' foreknowledge, that Jesus knew some things. He knew that his hour had come. And remember, that's a recurring theme throughout the Gospel of John. There were times in which the priests did not apprehend him. There were times that he... Because he said his hour had not yet come. Now Jesus says he knows that this is it. The hour has come. Jesus knew that he would depart this world and return to the Father. In fact, Genesis, uh, John 13, 14, 15, 16, and into 17 is all motivated by the fact that Jesus knows he's going to depart earth. And he has walked with these men for three and a half years. He has been there everything, and he's going to be gone. He's going to leave them, but he wants to give them some instructions and some encouragement so that when he is gone, they will not just fall apart. So the next chapters that we're going to be looking at is going to have some teaching that Jesus, not teaching to the multitude like the Sermon on the Mount, but very, very personal teaching that Jesus is talking to those men who had walked with him during those three and a half years, and now he knows you, can you imagine if you knew when you were going to die and you'd gather your family to you and what would you say to them? Let me tell you, you wouldn't waste time on trivial things, would you? You would tell them what you believe to be the most important things to help them make it, to help them overcome. And Jesus was not only concerned about them, but he was concerned about the fact that they were going to be charged with carrying on the mission and the ministry of Jesus. And so he gives them some instructions Jesus revealed that he knew of Judas's betrayal. We see it more often now in John's gospel that Jesus will mention the fact that one of them was going to betray him, and Jesus already knew. Jesus knew that the Father had given all things over to him, and Jesus knew that he had come from the Father and that he was going back to the Father. The second thing that this account reveals is Jesus' immense love for his disciples. 
And I love that about this passage of Scripture. That's why John, I think, is one of my favorite Gospels. John is, of course, known as the the beloved disciple, the the one whom Jesus loved. In fact, John doesn't even mention his own name in the gospel. He always refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And John is the apostle of love, we could say, especially if you read over 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And the gospel here reveals Jesus' immense love for his disciples. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them, John says. He loved them to the end. The end, to the end, And we might think, well, that means he loved him to the end of his life. But that's not what he meant. He's not denoting chronology. But that Jesus loved his disciples to the uttermost. That Jesus loved them to the furthest extent possible. He loved them to the end. He loved them to to the uttermost. Love is the theme of this final supper. John chapter 13 verse 1 forms what I call the first of the two bookends. Because in that, Jesus talks about his love for the disciples. But this portion will close in John chapter 13, verse 34. Look at it with me. With the second bookend of this discussion. But notice how first he loved them. But in John 13, 34, he lets them know that as recipients of Jesus' love, they are now commanded to love one another. First he said, I have loved them, and I have loved them to the end. And then he says, I have given you a new commandment. You who are the recipients of my love, I have given you a new commandment that you love one another. Look what he says, just as I have loved you. So first he models it, and then he commands it. First he gives it, and then he asks of it of us. And how appropriate. By this will all men know or all people know that you are my disciples. If what? If you have love for one another. If you have love for one another. Would be the characteristic, the defining mark upon the true followers of Jesus Christ. Is that we would be known for our love for one another. And so it's a wonderful, wonderful passage in which it begins with Jesus' love towards us. But then, as recipients of his love, we are called to love one another just as he has loved us. The synoptics focused on the meaning of the new covenant. But John focuses on the new commandment. Love one another. John 13, 14, 15, 16, and into 17 includes Jesus' final discourse with his disciples. The motivation is Jesus' love for them. He reveals again that the time of his departure is at hand. Jesus came forth from the Father. He'll soon be returning to the Father. And in the next chapters, Jesus will encourage and instruct his disciples in preparation for his departure so that they will not only be successful and victorious and keep the faith, but so that they will carry on with the mission and the ministry of Jesus so that uh, the, the, the whole world will come to know him. This passage of scripture reveals not only his foreknowledge, his immense love for the disciples, it reveals Jesus as the suffering servant. And this is a very important image, especially when we juxtapose it with what we've talked about, the great discouragement, the great um, reason that so many who had followed Jesus initially fell away was because their expectations of a Messiah, their hope of a Messiah Jesus didn't live up to it because they were looking for a political leader. They were looking for a military deliverer, and Jesus didn't fit that mold. They were looking for one who would come and just turn the world upside down and drive the Romans out and deliver them from the soldiers. But Jesus came to deliver us not from Rome, but deliver us from the power of of hell, the power of Satan. He came not to drive out the soldiers, but he came to defeat sin. And he came to bring, bring spiritual deliverance, not political or military deliverance. And so John here now paints a picture of Jesus, and he is revealed in this account as something that would be so foreign to their understanding or their expectation of what the Messiah should be, because he should be a king, he should be a conqueror, he should be above all else. And here we find that John presents him as a servant. And not just a servant, but the lowliest servant in the house. The lowest slave of the house was charged with the dirtiest and most humiliating job of washing the feet of the guests in preparation for the meal. The washing of feet happened 
uh, was supposed to happen as guests entered the home. And surely it had to happen before they took their place at the table. And surely it had to happen before the supper began. Remember that people did not bathe regularly as we do. Or turn to your neighbor and say, or as you should. The streets were filled with animal filth, dust, and everything else. People walked almost everywhere unless they had the means to have a donkey or a horse, but most people didn't. They walked. Their feet were not, you know, I, I think back upon, I grew up in a church that believed that we had two ordinances, well, three ordinances, I guess it is. They, we have in the Assemblies of God baptism and communion, but in the Church of God we had three. We had baptism, we had communion, and we had foot washing. We had foot washing. And let me tell you, if we were to have a foot washing, uh, everybody would make sure to show up with no socks with holes in them. That's the first one. Number two, probably before you came to church, you would bathe and scrub your feet and maybe put some powder or perfume because you wouldn't want to be the one with smelly feet. I would venture to say that some of us would probably make an appointment somewhere uh, the week before and get us a pedicure in anticipation of having our feet washed. Well, I can assure you that on that day when Jesus stooped down to wash their feet, their feet were not well pedicured. Their feet were callous. Their feet were crusty. I don't want to just be, be uh, crude about it, but their feet were dirty. And they had not bathed in days or perhaps weeks. And so this was not a, sometimes we look at feet washing and when it's practiced in churches, it is a ceremony. It really is not the true representation of what Christ did because it's ceremonial. But when Jesus did it, it wasn't ceremonial, it was practical. And it wasn't something that was a very moving and very spiritual. It was a very dirty job to have done, but it met a practical need. A special meal like the one the disciples were gathered at would require that their feet be washed in preparation to take their place at the table. But the Bible tells us that when Jesus got up to wash their feet, they were already eating. Perhaps, perhaps they looked around to see if anyone would wash feet. But none of them dared to do it lest they be perceived as being less than the others. So they might have been looking around saying, who's going to wash feet here? I'm not doing it. Peter's going to think he's better than I am if I get down there and wash his feet. And Peter's saying, well, I'm not going to do it. I, I'm, I'm more important here than any of these other guys. I'm not going to do it. In fact, the other Gospels reveal the subject of conversation at that Last Supper, and it's very revealing. I love to take the, take the Gospels and kind of fill in the information that John does, not and it provides some context, and it helps us really to even appreciate it better. Because the other Gospels tells, tell us this. The description of the events in the Last Supper in Luke chapter 22 reconciles very well with the narrative in John chapter 13, because in Luke chapter 22, he tells us that there was a dispute that developed among the disciples as to which one of them was regarded as being the greatest. And he said to them, Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles domineer over them, and those who have authority over them are called benefactors. But it is not this way for you. Rather, the one who is the greatest among you must become like the youngest and the leader like the servant for who is greater. The one who reclines at the table, and that's one of the problems with the famous depiction of the Last Supper. They're not seated Western style like we are around the table. They are reclining. Who is greater, the one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? And that's naturally, we would say, the one who is seated, being served, is greater. But I, Jesus said, am among you, not as one who is seated to be served, but as one who has come to serve. Merle Tenney states this, they, the disciples, were ready to fight for a throne, but not for a towel. And let me tell you, 2,000 years later, not much has changed about human nature. We will still fight for a throne, but nobody wants to pick up the towel. I remember in my last pastorate particularly, 
when a group, any of the ministries were going to have an event, I would say, okay, you've got to make sure that you have three lists. You have to have a list of who is going to set everything up. All your volunteers. You have to have a, a list of who is going to serve during the event. And you have to have a list of who's going to clean up after the event. And there was one list that filled up first. And it was to serve during the event. Because there is something in all of us that we want to people to see what we're doing the second list had about half as many people and that was the list of who wanted to come and help before the event but oftentimes it was a blank sheet of paper when it came to who was going to stay and take out the trash and scrub the pots and sweep and mop the floor those are the jobs nobody wanted and so we see here that Jesus showed us that in the kingdom of God, there is this idea that we are not here to be served, but to serve. I've got to move quick. Servant leadership is a term that has come in vogue in, in the last 20, 30 years, not only in the church world, but even in, the sec in some sectors of the corporate world, believe it or not. The idea of a servant leader, the idea that the best form of leadership is not a tyrannical, dictatorial boss but someone who earns the affection and loyalty of those he leads, he or she leads, by the example of service, humility, and sacrifice. And Jesus is the greatest example. And this passage of Scripture reveals him as a servant, as a servant leader. I've examined this passage many, many times. And we may not get all as far as I'd like to go today because I want to share with you some things I've learned from this passage. I've meditated upon it many, many times. The Bible tells us that Jesus, knowing that the Father had handed over all things to him, that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, he got up from supper, laid out his outer garments, and he took a towel and tied it around himself. I've come to this conclusion. Insecure people do not good servants make. Insecure people do not good servants make. And I get that from that passage of Scripture because we see here that when a person needs attention, praise, a title, position, recognition. It's actually a sign of insecurity. Jesus, the Bible tells us, knew who he was. And therefore, he had nothing to prove to anyone. Jesus knew where he had come from, and he knew where he was going. This made him willing and able to do anything, even wash dirty feet. Friends, when you know who you are, you know where you've come from and you know where you're going, you lose the need to have to prove something to others and you gain the ability to be able to do whatever needs to be done, even if it's washing dirty feet. Now, I'm not talking about ceremoniously. I'm not talking about, about in a way to be seen of men. I'm talking in a very practical way of meeting needs and taking care of things that nobody else wants to touch. Jesus knew, listen, he would be betrayed. But that didn't stop him from loving and serving. And I have encountered in church 21 years of pastoring so many people who say, Pastor, I used to be involved, I used to serve, I used to do this, I used to do that, but I got hurt. And I know that if I get involved, I'm going to get hurt. Well, you know what? You're right. Because in 21 years of pastoring, I can tell you, there have been many times that I have been hurt. There have been people that have betrayed. There are people that have been ungrateful. There are people that have been two-faced, there are people that have been hypocritical, there's people that have, whatever the case may be. But Jesus showed us something. He knew that there was a betrayer in the room. And most of us would have pouted, most of us would have been mad, most of us would have said, well, I'm going to strike first before he strikes me. But Jesus took the towel and it is safe to assume that among the feet that Jesus washed that day were the feet of him who would 
sell him for a few scraps of silver. When we humble ourselves, no one is able to humiliate us. The disciples were not willing to wash feet because they did not want to be humiliated by others. But Jesus was confident and secure in his identity, and he didn't have anything to prove. The Bible says he poured water into the basin. He began washing the disciples' feet, wiping them with the towel, which he had tied around himself. Paul would go on to reveal that Jesus' self-humiliation led to his exaltation. There's a great truth in this, that when we exalt ourselves, God will humble us. But when we humble ourselves, God will will exalt us. Philippians 2, if any encouragement, any consolation of love, any fellowship, any affection, compassion, make my joy complete, being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose, do nothing, he said, from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility, consider one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. Then he said this, have this attitude, In yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who though he existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, something to be held on to tightly. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, and not just any death, but we talked about it last week, death on a cross. And for this reason, don't miss that, For this reason, because of Jesus' self-humiliation, God hath highly exalted him and given him the name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Jesus is revealed not only as the servant, but Jesus is revealed in this passage of Scripture as the sanctifier because John's gospel sometimes has two layers to it. There is the fact that Jesus cleansed the filth off their feet. But then Jesus says something to Simon Peter to let us know that by so doing this, he is revealing that he has come to wash us and cleanse us, not just from the filth of mud and and dung and whatever else, but he has come to wash us and cleanse us and sanctify us from the filth of sin. Jesus came to Simon Peter And you know, the others were thinking it, but Peter said it. That's always been the case with Simon Peter. All of them thought it. They were probably all thinking the same thing, but Peter was the one who opened his big mouth and say it. And so I I can sympathize a little bit with Peter because sometimes people are thinking it. I'm going to go ahead and say it. And and he said, Lord, you're washing my feet. And Jesus answered and said to Simon Peter, verse 6, What am I doing? You do not realize right now, but you will understand later. That lets us know that this had a greater significance, a greater meaning to it than just washing the filth off his feet. And Peter said to him, never shall you wash my feet. Jesus answered, if I do not wash you, the the physical cleansing, but he's talking about the spiritual cleansing. If I do not wash you, if I do not sanctify you, you have no place with me. And Simon Peter said to him, Lord, then wash not only my feet, but my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, he who has bathed needs only wash his feet, otherwise he's completely clean. Are you, and you are clean. And that, he was not talking about physically, but he was talking about the spiritual cleansing. But not all of you. For he knew that one who was betraying him, it was for this reason that he said, not all of you are clean. Jesus' act of humiliation and service provided cleansing For the disciples, not just in that upper room, but he is, of course, pointing towards the fact that he is the great sanctifier. He is the great cleanser, and he is going to remove our iniquity. He's going to remove the stench of sin and death from us. I'm going to be thankful today that you are clean because Jesus Christ has washed you, and he 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 has washed you clean. Then he does, just like he did with the call to love, he models it. And then he commands it. And this is a great uh, lesson for all of us in teaching and discipleship, not only for our children, but for anybody that we would try to lead. Model it before you command it. He modeled it. He did it. He washed their feet. He humbled himself to the lowest rung in the social ladder of the house, the lowest 
slave of the house, the, the, the one who, the, the last one to arrive, got the worst job, and Jesus modeled it because he went to the lowest place and washed feet. And then what did he say in verse 12? After he had washed their feet and taken his garment and reclined at the table again, he said, Do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are correct, for so I am. So if I, the Lord and teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Remember, he said, I have loved you to the end. And then what do you say? Love one another. And then he washed their feet. He modeled it. And then what did he say? You've seen me do it. Now go and do you likewise. Wash one another's feet. Now, I don't believe, though I grew up in the church of God, I, 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 I'm assembly of God. Now I don't believe that that meant Jesus was instituting a ceremony, that Jesus was instituting a ritual that we would gather because, as I said, we would have a very sanitized version of washing of feet. But this is talking about being willing to serve others, being willing to do those jobs, being willing to humble yourself in need of those that need your help in very practical ways. So I, I believe that when Jesus commands us to wash feet, he's not talking about ceremoniously, but I think he's talking about in a very practical way, meeting practical needs that people might have. And probably all of us could think of the, most, the dirtiest job somebody might need done in their house. And yet there may be a, an occasion in which you might encounter somebody that needs somebody to do it for them, needs that help. And Jesus is saying, be willing and be humble enough to meet people's most practical need, even if it's the dirtiest job in the house. I'll let you come to your own conclusions of what that might be. Jesus said in verse 15, for I gave you an example so that you also would do just as I did for you. So he wasn't just doing it for their benefit, so they'd have clean feet at this, this supper, but he was using this again there was the level, what you see, but then there was the deeper level, deeper meaning of it, where he is saying, listen, this is something I am showing you how to love one another by the example that I have set. Verse 16, truly, truly, I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is the one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Just as Jesus demonstrated his love for the disciples in verse 1, then commanded the disciples to love one another, verse 34, Jesus modeled humble servanthood to his disciples, but now he commands them to follow his example. Let's stand together. We're going to stop right there because if we get into the next part, it'll get And then I'll have to hurry. And I don't want to do that. So, what did we learn? We learned that Jesus revealed at that Last Supper his immense love for the disciples. He said, I've loved you, them to the end. But then, how many here are recipients of that love? How many are recipients of that love? He's loved you to the end. He's loved you to the uttermost. To those same people who are the recipients of his infinite love he commands that you love one another just as I have loved you that's a tall order to fill Jesus revealed that he is the servant friends so many times the work of the Lord doesn't prosper because we all want to be seen we all want to have position of, of prestige, perhaps, but there are many times a shortage of people willing to do those, those jobs, getting their hands dirty, and we must always have that same spirit, just as Jesus modeled it for us, let us also, let us also serve one another in very practical ways, and then Jesus demonstrated that he's the great sanctifier. So as he was washing their feet, he was revealing that he had come to cleanse them and to wash them and to remove 
their impurity from them. Aren't you thankful today that he has washed us? Jesus has cleansed us and removed our impurity from us. So tonight as we leave this place, let us meditate upon that night. And let us also hear the commands of Jesus towards us to love one another and to serve one another just as he has served us. Amen. Father, we thank you today that the revelation of Jesus is so complete. It is so full and it is so powerful. And Lord, it speaks to us today. God, we thank you that we have received your love. That the servant gave his life for us. We thank you that we were cleansed as Jesus washed our sin away. Thank you, Lord. But God, we also recognize that we have been given a commandment. That as we have been loved by you, we must now also love one another. Lord, we have also been given a commandment that just as Jesus was willing to, to lay aside all of his privilege in order to take the place of a servant and do that most vile of jobs, that uh, we must also have that same willingness of heart to humble ourselves and serve one another in meaningful, practical, sacrificial ways. And Lord, tonight we thank you that we have been cleansed and made clean. Washing of the water of the word. You have cleansed us, O oh Lord. And made us a people fit to sit at the table and partake of the great banquet you have prepared for us. We thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God richly bless you tonight and I ask you to join us Sunday morning, 9 o'clock and 1030 as we continue the wonderful spirit of revival and wonderful spirit of worship and victory that's in the house and where it's going to continue. Amen. Amen. So join us Sunday morning.